I'll start the second point. Again, I'm producing a, a blank, looks like this, from which I'll make the ornaments you see arrayed on that stand. Yeah, yeah, straight tubing, I think that's a pretty good reference for what I use. It's funny, I'm not used to thinking about it, I just kind of have it in my head as what it looks like, sure. It's surprising with repetition how consistent you can become without much effort to measure anything. Really? Now, as opposed to when I pulled that first handle, I'm going to melt more material this time because the, the next pull will be for two handles, the second handle for this blank and the first handle for the next blank. That may be more obvious as you see it happen. But because I'm pulling twice the length, I really need to take care to make sure I've got enough material involved. A little bit, yeah, you want to condense the material to build it up a little. It's certainly going to thin out as I stretch, so you want to start out extra heavy. And again, just keep it supported until it stabilizes. And there we are. And so that's how that blank was formed. Now that I've got a couple of those, I'll go ahead and start the first design. The color, this is the design I'll be doing. And I buy these, the color comes in these rods about the diameter of a pencil. And that's a little bit thick for, for use. It can make a finer line if I cut that back some. So what I'm going to do is seal a few together heat a, a length of maybe an inch or so on each side, and then pause, let the temperatures stabilize. And as it starts to set up, I'll draw that out. I do, yeah. Most of my colors that I use are North Star. I use a little bit of a glass alchemy. This is a North Star red exotic, or exotic red, I forget which way. <laughs> I never can remember that. The way I started this draw causes a little distortion at the end of the rod that I don't want. And so I picked that distortion off. That way it won't play a role in the finished design. I'm using white with this unit too, and it looks, I think I have enough white pulled out. So I'm ready to go. It's important to make sure things are nice and straight before you start. I usually have a little bit of tweaking to do in that regard. Make sure not to overheat when you're just trying to straighten it. You can, hopefully you're starting with just a s slight misalignment. Rather than straightening it, you can make a small problem into a big problem if you're not careful. Now I'm getting ready to apply the color. Hot glass won't stick to cold glass, so it's important that I warm up that substrate material first. If you get the right temperature in the right place, you can put this glass on almost like drawing a line with a pencil. Yeah, the majority of the fire is on the color, but a little bit has to be on the, the clear tube to help them bond. And so I've 
best as I could, tried to judge four separate sections there. This one went pretty well. Now I'll split those with a stripe of white in between each. I think I can get one more stripe out of this. I like to do things to add texture to my work. I think that it makes them reflect the light in more interesting ways. And so for that reason, in between each color, I'm going to lay a band of clear rod right over the clear tube. Again, just for texture. The clear rod is a little bit smaller in diameter, so I've found that I don't have the same need to draw that out as I do with the color. I think I have one more to go after this. Nope, two more. Okay, now we have that on. The next step is to reheat that whole section that I've applied color to. I'm not gonna really melt it. I just wanna get it up to a temperature where it's malleable. And then I'll rotate one hand a little, a little faster than the other. And it will form that spiral you see in the model there. I judge the temperature and how the glass will behave, whether it's malleable or flowing, by the intensity at which it glows in the flame. I don't know if you can make out that spiral developing now, but I've begun to, I've begun to twist. In doing so, I get some distortion, and so I've just puffed a little bit of air in there to blow out that distorted area. choke back my fire for a, a thinner band of heat. I'm stretching now, which thins the material out. And then the idea is to run that thin material in the flame and get it started collapsing. I want to form sort of an hourglass constriction, but after I do so, I don't want the wall thickness to be thin in that area, and it won't be. In fact, it may be a little bit thicker than the tube started with. Yeah. As it collapses, it wants to draw back in on itself. Its tendency is to gather in on itself as it melts, and so that's the idea. I utilize that to keep it from being too thin. After each step, you have to rotate until it stabilizes, keep things on an axis. Now I'll do that again. Again, by judgment, hoping to segment this section of tubing into three reasonably equal parts. I get it really hot to create these constrictions, and one of the challenges there is to control your rotation so that you don't untwist the twist that I've formed initially. I've seen that done on purpose in decorative ways that can form a zigzag kind of an effect, which is sort of cool. I haven't tried that on any of my work yet, but it's coming. <laughs> it's 
now a bigger fire and I'll blow out that center section. It's not really a sphere, but it'll start out as a sphere. I'll blow it up around and then squish it into that disc shape. There's not that much to the blowing part. It's a very light puff and I don't try to blow it up very big all at once. I like to sort of increment my way up into it. So you in and out. Mm -hmm. As that starts to flatten out when I go in the flame, I try to stay just on that outer edge. It helps it to take on that disc shape as I squeeze. Uh, depending on how symmetrically it came up, I have a little tweaking to do on this one. Oftentimes one side will be a little flatter than the other or so forth. So. I'm just going to pull that top out. Again, because I like texture, I'll put clear glass beads all around that ridge I've formed. Sort of depositing the molten glass on the end of the rod, and you'll see after each bead, go back in the flame with the rod to melt more. It's almost, it's almost like dipping a brush in paint. And in relative terms, they go on a little bit cold, and so I like to reheat them and make sure each one of those is fused in well. satisfied with that. Now I'm going to do kind of the same process on each end. I'm not going to try to split it in the center though. I'm going to go off to the right. I'm trying to get sequentially smaller disks as I move out to the end. Once I have the colors on there, you can't tell with a clear tube, but with the colors on there, you can get a better sense of the rate at which I'm rotating. And it may seem fast at times or not, but it doesn't really matter how fast or slow I turn. It's very critical that I tune, turn uniformly enough to apply even heat. But there are a few circumstances where the rate of rotation or the speed really matter. Yeah, and you'll see I continue to reheat the spots. And uh, I'm watching as I push it up and applying a little more heat in the areas that don't seem to be moving the way I want them to as I push.
Now I could finish this side complete and go back, but I like to go back and forth. It helps me strike a little more symmetric balance. And when I reverse sides, I have to reverse the, the end that's open so that I can blow in there. So I've cut open the end that had been closed and remelt, or melted the end that had been open. If you look real close, you might notice that as I'm developing that constriction, I don't, in fact, keep the twist going in the same direction all the time. It gets all sorts of things happen, but I, the glass is at a temperature where it's, I can manipulate it so that by the time it's set, it's where it belongs. I'll do that final draw on the end. I want to get the flame into the color just a little bit so that it just kind of wraps over the edge, but most of that pull out the end is going to be clear too. It's not as steady as it looks until it has a few seconds to stabilize. But this is the well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we come to that later. <laughs> That's the bridge we cross when we come to it. I've always kind of left that decision to last. And after 9-11, my wife and I designed and did a, uh, a patriotic motif, you know, and, and I now do one as a version of it as, as product. And when you do a red, white, and blue, it does matter which is the top and which is the bottom. You, you can't decide later then. I found out, as you might imagine, the hard way. Give me a 50-50 chance and I'll blow it.
Now again, I'm reversing operation, so I'm going to cut open this end and melt the other end. One of the things you want to do in terms of thinking ahead is pull these handles long enough so that you can melt the end and still have it far enough away from your hands. <laughs> yeah. So now I can have a little, little audience participation. You want to weigh in on whether that should be the top <laughs> or this? Uh, this way? You're on. And at this point, I, I open up both ends so it's clear through now. I don't need to trap air because I'm done blowing and shaping. And in fact, I'm going to close it at this point where I judge to be the top. I'm going to melt that tube to the extreme so that it actually collapses down into solid molten glass. I'm going to continue to run more air out so I have a large enough mass there. And then I'm going to form the, the glass hoop that it will hang from. It's really unstable at this point, flip floppy. But if you continue to rotate and angle it down, you'll be all right. Now, this tool is my maker's mark. At this point, I'll re-soften the surface at the base of the loop. Just kind of press my initials right in there. I'm sealing a temporary handle onto the top of that loop. And that extension will allow me to reheat the whole ornament in preparation for closing it off. I seal mine closed, and so it's important to make sure you've driven out any moisture before you do that.
And there's that. And when it cools in a few minutes, I can hold the ornament itself to pull that, that last handle off. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next one I'm going to do will be this design in blue. And so I'll get my white out of the way so I don't get confused. Bring the blue over. And because I'm using all one color, I need a pretty fair amount of it. So I'm just going to take a minute and make sure I have enough cane pulled. There's a couple of ways to do this cane pulling. This isn't the best way to pull a long section of cane, but it's the easiest way to pull a short section. So a short piece is all you need. This is my preference. So I keep pulling these little nubs off all the time. I've got a coffee can full of them at home. I'm going to do something with one of these days. <laughs> yeah. So I've got one long piece here. I'm starting in the middle. I'm going to do pretty much the same process, though. Pull out one side, and then draw out the other side. Just only difference is the seal in between. And I do it in two steps, because I'm not particularly good at that other technique where it allows you to pull them really long. That's really hard to do. I'm sorry, you were saying? Oh, I'm just curious. You've got a really wide thing to, to heat up the hammer. Yeah, I want a lot of area heated because that's where I get the length from. It's a fluffy area. Yep, soft, forgiving fire. <laughs> <laughs> The ones that I just pulled are hot, so I'm going to avoid putting them right on the metal bench. I don't want to be surprised by any cracks. Also, just in case I have time to do a third design, I'm going to pull the point for that now. So we'll go back to the early part of the process again. After I pull my first point, before I pull the next, I want to take a minute and make sure that's straight while I have the, the raw tube to reference off of. You don't want to have one of these little sections of tubing with a crooked point on both sides. That's not a good starting point at all. Right. 
when I'm trying to straighten things and decide whether it's straight, I like to look at this sort of compound angle rather than looking straight on it like that. I feel like I get a little better view. Now for this design, whereas on the first one, I stripe the whole length with color. In this design, I do some starting and stopping. And I want to start and stop uniformly. So I'm going to create two grooves in the tube that will serve as a visual reference so I know where to begin and end the application of color. To form those grooves, heat a narrow band and stretch. Let that subsequent thin material roll in the fire and then squeeze together as it starts to collapse. Again, it's a smaller area, but I still need to preheat it to get it ready to receive the color. I'm going to put on a lot of stripes here, but I don't continuously striping continuous striping from one next to the other. I go back and forth because I think if I continue working in sequence, I'll get a hot spot, I'm afraid. So I distribute the heat a little better this way. It may not be necessary, but it feels safer. Yeah, it's, it's important that you get a nice neat pull off, not only for the end, but so that you have a nice neat end to start your next stripe with. And it's a matter of temperature control. And when you pull off, pull straight off at a right angle to the tube into the fire, and that will help too. Any little tail you do get will melt back in. Another sort of a fine point there is realize that as you're laying it on, your heating glass that's going to be laid on in another millimeter or two. So when you get down to the end, if you stop heating the glass and just deplete that last millimeter or so, you'll have less waste when you pull away. I hate it when I blow in the closed end. <laughs> Good to keep track of which end is open for sure. Same deal here as earlier on that other unit. I'm going to get that whole color region up to a malleable point. And just start turning one hand a little faster than the other. I'm going to do a constriction a little bit different this time. I'm going to really melt a lot more material than you saw me do so on the other ornament. And I'm going to draw that constriction out longer. And again, I'm placing the fire so that some of the color is drawn down into the kind of valley that I'm creating.
you run it down almost to the point where you're risking collapsing the tube. But I do have to avoid that. Should it collapse, I wouldn't be able to continue through the process. You'll note I'm not always turning in one direction. That's really not necessary. It's necessary to heat evenly. And when the glass is hot enough, it's necessary to compensate for gravity. But you don't have to turn in one direction to achieve either one of those things. And I was just double checking which end is closed. I'm squeezing a little to condense the material for the same reason I did when I pulled those points to stretch out is to thin the material and blowing it larger will have the same effect. So they're just different forms of stretching. Next, I'm going to form these two little elements here. So, to do that, I'm just going to heat a narrow band and squeeze. Sometimes I find it necessary to blow in for these, and other times I don't, depending on how thick the material I'm working with is mostly. So now I've formed that, that little element. Let it stabilize and then I'm gonna trim it out with, with beads again. In this case, I'll use cobalt for the beads. Yeah, I just found this wooden box and it seems to be made right. for me. <laughs> just the right thing. And that, you know, that's the kind of thing that will vary per person, but whatever it takes to be in a comfortable posture is worth doing. You know, it provides for a steadier hand and uh, translates directly into the merits of the work. And the quality of your life over the long, <laughs> over a long day. <laughs> Yeah, mm hmm I find it more comfortable, and I, I guess that's all that matters in a sense, but one practical reason for standing is it's a pretty big fire when I'm pulling points. And standing allows me to step away from it while I'm waiting for the point to set up. Yep.
Now this time I'm going to apply color the same way as I did in the central body of the ornament. The only difference will be I'm not going to twist this time. I like the contrast of the straight to the twisted. And it's a challenge because I, I think it's actually more difficult not to twist than it is to twist once you have the color on there. At this point, I have to get it hot enough to be able to seal the color to it. But if I overheat this region, this whole unsupported weight is going to sag over on me. So it's a, that's the balance I'm striking there. So right now, the heat that I'm putting in is significant. I'm forming a particular heat pattern. I want to draw this out long, and it's already hot enough. If I stretch, it'll get longer. But it won't necessarily be the gradual taper that I'm looking for. That's a function of where I put heat before I stretch. Now, having drawn that out, I'm going to heat that shoulder region just compress it a little bit to square that up. Now all I have to do is make this side look like the other side. <laughs> Symmetry itself is the hard part, it seems. And those lines may not stay straight as I'm heating and pulling, but I, I manage it so that they end up straight by the time the glass is stable. And again, it's not as stable as it looks maybe at this point. <laughs> That's why I have to keep turning after each step. Now we're good. Can I choose this time? Yes. I want this to be the top. <laughs> that end's already open. Now with these, the, when I use color throughout, I'm not able to just collapse the tube and make the loop because the color doesn't look good. Oh, yeah. It gets all kinds of kind of funky looking in that area, so I just strip it away. And he had a gather of clear. Do you use like prefab a whole bunch of them and then you have to no. do it this way? No, no, I do them this way, but prefabbing them is a perfectly reasonable way to go, yeah. The way I do them, perhaps, would be considered a disadvantage reasonably for some, depending on your goals. But the one thing about doing them this way, you tend to end up with a little bit of a thicker base on one side than the other. 
and one might consider that a reason not to go this way. For me, I utilize that. That's where I put my mark, so I, I take advantage of it. Yeah, the designs don't offer a lot of surface to sign or anything like that, so that was the best solution I could come up with. I'm rounding that mostly by hanging it down and using gravity, but I'll let the tool bring it the rest of the way for me. Now we'll go on with a temporary handle like I did on the first one. And when this one's done, I'll be able to take the handle off of that. So there's that design. Now we can get the handle off of this one. I used to use punties here, and I found that occasionally when they broke off, they'd take a little divot out of the loop, and I'd have to patch it back in. And I thought, well, if I have to do that, I might as well just melt them off. You know? And then, of course, I limit the likelihood of having them break prematurely and fall and, you know. So now, uh, the next design is this clear one here on the rack. It's one of a few asymmetric designs that I do. Is that it, the one and it gets stretched out in the long tail. Yeah, that's, that's actually not one that I put frit inside of, but I, and those, what you're thinking of is not frit. Those are actually that's specifically applied dots. Yeah, but I call that a confetti motif, and that is one of the designs I do it in. straight and ready to go. Nice thing with clear is I don't have to pre-draw it out at all. Because it's, it's a smaller diameter, I use a five millimeter rod. And uh, I guess the color is probably about seven. But also the clear just tends to melt a little smoother.
a little bit of a nasty end on this one, so I'm gonna clean that off before I start striping it on. Just wipe them down dry, yeah. This handle's a little long, it's bumping on the bench, so I'm just gonna get the excess out of my way. Glass is a really good insulator. And with the thicker five millimeter rod, not having drawn it down small, it can get kind of stuck. So it's, it's not easy to see, but I'm actually rotating it counterclockwise as I'm striping it on. And that allows you to get the temperature all the way around it so you don't run out of steam halfway through your pull. You might have noticed that first stripe didn't go so well, pulled off prematurely. And I'm thinking, as long as I don't get another one like that, it'll probably come out OK. It's down in the bottom section where it's going to get very melted anyway. The glass doesn't conduct heat very much at all really hold my hand very close to where the glass is melted. But as the rod gets shorter, your fingers start getting closer to the fire. That's another matter. It's important not to overheat at this point because I could get it hot enough that that texture I just created melts right back to a smooth surface again. going to start doing a little pre-shaping for the top of this. It has a flat top, kind of like a crown. And I'm not going to form it yet, but I'm going to start it. Now I'm heating for that narrow neck up near the top. This I will pull out sooner if I heat it as much as I otherwise would for something like this, I will, in fact, melt it back to smooth. And I really don't want that effect, so got a little bit of a different balance to strike on this one. Just tweaking the alignment, making sure things are nice and straight. And a larger fire to draw out that long tail section.
now blow up this region of tube that remains into a nice round sphere. Still maintaining the spiral and making sure not to overheat so I end up smooth. This gets an element kind of like those in this section of neck. Yeah, heating a narrow spot and squeezing. And if all goes great, I don't need to blow. That that's not a majority of the time though. <laughs> So now I'll add some clear beading around that element. I'm hanging it down to let gravity persuade them towards center a little better than they were as I melt them. Now I'm going to go in and form that flat top and that apply some more beads, create that sort of crown effect at the top. So I've collapsed in the upper section. Now I want to blow out a bit just below that. And then I'll be squeezing to crisp up that shoulder. There we go.
Stretching a little bit, but mostly I want the glass to melt and thicken up. The area where I ultimately close it off has to be thick enough to be stable. And now I'm going to, oh, this is the end that's been melted closed. I'm going to pop that open. So I can collapse this area into a solid mass for the loop. There are some exceptions, uh, sort of the family and friends list. And when I make them here for class demonstrations, sometimes I don't because they're going for the whatever auction they have here for demo work. But any that were made for the market have that mark on them. There's a little spot where that pole went bad. Mm -hmm. It almost disappeared. <laughs> Just keep my fingers away from the fire. <laughs> Self-preservation. <laughs> the farther I work to the right, the less it matters. That one. Thank you. And I'll pop the handle off of here. Nice thing about this tool, if necessary, after moving the handle, I can re true that. Uh, well, that's those three. 